Sitcoms in the 70s didn't get much more popular or progressive than The Mary Tyler Moore Show. It wasn't afraid to mention taboo topics including birth control and homosexuality. It put everything out into the open, but its cast did manage to keep a few things to themselves. Keep watching to see the secrets of the Mary Tyler Moore Show cast finally revealed. But critics and fans the cast was almost entirely different. Ed Asner hadn't yet established himself as a comedic actor when The Mary Tyler Moore Show aired its first episode, September 19, 1970. That didn't matter to casting director Ethel Winant. She believed in him after seeing him on the 1964 drama Slattery's People. The showrunners brought him in for an audition. No one liked his acting, especially his delivery of the now-famous line, You've got spunk, I hate spunk. They had already decided not to cast him until he turned around and walked right back in. He said he knew he was terrible, but seemed angry that they hadn't said anything to him about his delivery. He asked them what they wanted from the character. They worked as a team for half an hour until he gave them a second reading. He won over everyone, except Mary Tyler Moore herself. Gavin McLeod came on next after Ed. He read for the role of Lou Grant, but asked to read for co-worker Murray Slaughter instead. The casting directors agreed he was better for the part. Rhoda Morgenstern was one of the last roles to be cast. Valerie Harper fought against 50 other actresses. She nailed the audition, but there was only one problem. She was too attractive. They had envisioned the character as Mary's frumpy friend. Director Jay Sandrich felt Valerie might still be right for the part, but asked her not to wear makeup for her callback. Her talent won the team over. They changed her character from being unattractive to only feeling she was unattractive and inferior to Mary. Betty White wasn't supposed to be a permanent fixture. Betty White first appeared in an episode of season four. She played Sue Ann Nivens, a sweet but aggressive and sex-crazed host of The Happy Homemaker Show. She tries to seduce Phyllis Lindstrom's husband until she appears with Sue Ann and tries to bake a chocolate souffle. Betty and Mary had been friends for years. She appeared on her doorstep with a real souffle the day after the episode aired. They eventually asked her to stay on as a series regular. Ted Knight almost stopped playing Ted Baxter. Mary Tyler Moore show producer Dave Davis saw Ted Knight in a local production of You Know I Can't Hear You When the Water's Running. He suggested they should drop all other possible actors like John Aniston and Lyle Wagoner and have him read for the part of Ted Baxter. He was a struggling actor at the time and had to use a bit of his rent money to purchase a blue blazer to look the part. The layers he brought to the character made it worth the investment. The role made Ted Knight famous and got him out of poverty, but he did come to resent it in a way. He walked into co-creator Alan Byrne's office crying one day. He said he couldn't play the character anymore because everyone couldn't separate him from his ditzy on-screen persona. Alan reminded him of other comedic actors who weren't like their characters. It was enough to console Ted, and he continued on. His character became a more well-rounded individual thanks to a few special episodes, and he even got married. This video is sponsored by Kamakoto Knives, which are made from high-quality Japanese steel using traditional centuries-old techniques. The first thing I noticed about these knives is the beautiful, heavy-duty ash wood box they come in. Not only is this great for storage, but it makes a great gift for any chef or knife enthusiast. Upon opening the box, I couldn't help but admire the craftsmanship that goes into each knife. Each one is handcrafted by an expert bladesmith, a 19-step process that takes several years to complete for a single Japanese steel knife. Then, each blade is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. I had never used a Japanese steel knife until Kamakoto, but even as a casual home chef, I immediately noticed the quality was way better than any knife I'd used before. It's reasons like these that Kamakoto knives are used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. Kamakoto has several special offers going on right now and is offering our viewers an extra $50 off any purchase with the discount code FAXVERSE on top of ongoing special offers. Go to kamakoto.com slash FAXVERSE to get your knives set and help support our channel. Hazel Frederick appeared in every episode. She might not be a name you know, but her face is familiar to all fans of The Mary Tyler Moore Show. She appeared in one of its most important scenes. Hazel Frederick exited Donaldson's department store in Minneapolis one day in 1969. She noticed Mary Tyler Moore walking by and tossing her hat into the air. It was such a gleeful scene that the show's crew filmed it for the opening credits. A bit of tragedy. 
Barbara Cloby appeared as Sherry in the episode Will Mary Richards Go to Jail. She was invited back for another called You Try to Be a Nice Guy. She gives Mary a revealing green dress that's still remembered by fans of the show. Barbara later co-starred in the Cloris Leachman spinoff. She filmed only three episodes before she and a male friend were tragically shot and killed in a parking lot in Venice, California, July 24, 1975. He lived long enough to describe the attackers, but they were never found. The Man Wanted Rhoda to Go Valerie Harper got along with everyone on the set and had no feuds. Her character also became popular enough to get a spin-off. The men were glad to see her go, even though it wasn't anything personal. Before her departure, most of the show's episodes took place in Mary's apartment and focused on the girls. The male cast knew that without her, there would be more scenes in the newsroom and they'd get more screen time. Competition when a woman like Mary Tyler Moore runs a show, it's natural for a bit of competition to begin between the men. Ed admits that he, Gavin, and Ted always tried to be her favorite actor. The MTM gag reel, where they try to sing the Johnny Mathis song Moore for her, is one of the best pieces of evidence. It's available to watch online. Relationships on set didn't always mirror the ones on screen. Gavin McLeod and Cloris Leachman had already had a negative work experience together before they filmed the show. They were as uncomfortable around each other as their characters were at first. It took them a few seasons to become friends. Ted Knight and Ed Asner's relationship, however, was one where art didn't imitate life. They were enemies in the show, but close in reality. They did get into an argument after filming wrapped, but it wasn't serious, and they reconciled before Ted's death from cancer in 1985. Ed also said the entire cast was like family for years. They were close, but snapped like taffy and went their separate ways in the end. Mary and Robert Redford Mary's crush on Robert Redford comes up several times throughout the series. This might be another instance of life imitating art. The real Mary Tyler Moore did work with him on Ordinary People, a film he directed in 1980. It's unclear whether she had a crush on him, though. Invisible Lars One of the most recognizable tropes in sitcoms is the invisible character that gets mentioned but often never showed in person. It's common in modern shows like The Big Bang Theory, but also found in many classic shows like Happy Days and The Dick Van Dyke Show. Lars Lindstrom is mentioned in several episodes of The Mary Tyler Moore Show, but is only referred to off-screen. He doesn't even appear in an episode called The Lars Affair that centers around him. What about mom and dad? Nanette Fabre played Mary's mother. She said in an Emmy TV Legends interview that she was disappointed to only appear on two episodes and never be asked back. She'd expected to become a series regular and even confronted Mary about it once. The show also found a place for John Aniston. He'd already been considered for other roles and got two callbacks for the role of the anchorman but was cast as Mary's father. Mary can dance. Georgia Engel does a dance number on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Mary does not, despite being a professional dancer like her character. There's one major episode that focuses on this issue. Mary admits her aspirations to become a ballerina, but fails when she tries to pull off a basic move. The show's creators felt they could draw on her real experience to inform the character. It still would have been interesting to see her move to music. The First Curtain Call Grant Tinker and Mary Tyler Moore decided to end the show after seven seasons. It still had strong ratings, but they didn't want to risk a dip in quality. Instead, they went out with a bang. It was the first network show to feature a final curtain call. The cast introduces themselves to the audience before the end credits roll. Spinoffs and following shows The Mary Tyler Moore show spawned a string of spinoffs of varying success. Lou Grant lasted five seasons and 114 eps. Rhoda had five seasons and 110 episodes, four of which never aired. Phyllis lasted for two seasons and 48 episodes. Every actor of the cast managed to star in shows after it ended. Gavin McLeod headlined The Love Boat that same year. Ed Asner had Lou Grant. Ted Knight starred in Too Close for Comfort. Reunions The Mary Tyler Moore Show had a 20th anniversary special in 1991. Most of the original cast came together to comment on old clips. Ted Knight had already died of cancer five years earlier. There was a sequel of sorts in 2000. It was called Mary and Rhoda and focused on Mary Richards and Rhoda Morgenstern. 
Cloris Leachman was offended that she wasn't invited. She picketed outside during shooting, but it was more of a way to tease her former castmates. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favorite member of the Mary Tyler Moore Show cast? Let us know in the comments section below.